This is a crowd podcast. Are you typing in CBT? King? No, I'm looking at the listener. No, I'm looking at the listener questions. I'm once ahead. We'll see it now. We'll Google okay. it later. Okay. <laughs> I want to see it. I want to oh. know how it works. So now that you're dating again, what are the plans? What's the vibe for Valentine's Day 23? Well, I mean. <laughs> I feel like I know what it is, but you probably can't say what it is. <laughs> I will 100% still be hanging out with Stace. Uh, Stace, if you're listening to this and we haven't made a plan yet, uh, can we please make a plan? <laughs> Stacey's um, Lauren's best friend, if yes. you haven't, if you didn't already know Oh, that. yeah, everyone knows Stacey. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I don't, yeah, like, the pre- like when you're kind of, like, dating or in situationships, it's kind of like, when do you go to that bit of, like, let's spend Valentine's together or let's... So yeah, I'm. Uh, I'm. Uh, I don't hate it as much as I probably have in the last few years. I'm open to it. I'm open to Progress. receiving presents from my many. Uh, stop it! St- honestly, <laughs> we're like a thirty seconds into this recording. <laughs> I'm open to receiving presents from presents. my many secret admirers. Presents. My vibe is like, yeah, I'm cool with it, and maybe I'll do some stuff. But okay. if not, basically, it'll still be proper galentines i'm actually celebrating proper galentines this year so for anyone who watches parks and rec or has watched parks and rec galentines day is the 13th of february and it's the best day of the year and it's where you get all your girls together and i'm going to see a show with someone i used to work with and i'm very excited it's galentines day is more my vibes babes uh what are you and matt doing this year i I think i might cook a nice meal this year last year was it last year i think it was he took me out for a really nice meal plan something like i think i was a bit moany like you never do anything romantic <laughs> <laughs> so he was like next year it's your turn so i might just pick something nice um but valentine's day is just another don't say it it's just don't consumerism, do it. <laughs> isn't it it's just consumerism and we just all have to buy into that we have to buy cards and presents and it's then you feel cute. shit if you don't get them no it is nice and i think if there's thought there then it's nice but it's just yeah. Like, you know how I feel about Christmas. <laughs> is it literally like Christmas but pink? No, I don't mind it as much. <laughs> I definitely don't have as strong feelings about it as I do as Christmas. <laughs> I think it's nice, but I just don't really like, I don't go ham on it. No, I actually really do like Valentine's Day as yeah. a concept. I think it's super cute. It's like an excuse to kind of like show someone you love someone and whether that person is a romantic person or a friend or your family or I think I spent valentine's 21 with me mother because we were in lockdown 74 <laughs> and love we had a lovely time we had a oh my god we did we did like the the m&s like dining for two i think and I, remember like, yes, doing and I remember that. going like around this big m&s and you could see all the couples <laughs> there like with their masks on all queued up ready to get their dining i was like there's me and my mother but we had oh. a lovely time so it's just about showing some people that you love them you should do that 365 days of the year to be yeah, fair I was but sometimes people need a reminder to be nice to each other that's true. and to have fabulousness but but do you have anything for the bag of dicks this week? Yeah, I do, actually. Something that I've seen a lot on TikTok and has been really bothering me. And I was like, that can go into the bag of dicks. <laughs> Did you really think that? that's so good? Perfect. So basically, there's this TikTok trend where people, someone goes around like, one of them was in a gym, to be fair. And then uh, like on the street or whatever. And mm. they just ask random people, would you date somebody who was overweight? Now, I don't really love that overweight term. Like, it's it such mean? a leading question. It's a really leading question. But if you're asking certain people, it's such a leading question. Yeah. And I think, okay, so there are a few issues with it. <laughs> just a few. Just a few. <laughs> I think I will, first of all, I just will say that sexual attraction is not a choice. So it's, if you're saying like, I'm not really attracted to bigger people, like I, I think that's, that's, that's fair. fine. Yeah, fine. That's fair. It's like, we all have our preferences. But what I didn't like was a lot of the commentary, like I would say like 80 to 90% of it was around, I wouldn't date them because it shows a lack of willpower and self-discipline and self-control. And that just made me quite cross because I think that's quite a lazy attitude. It's stupid. It's also not factual. It's not factual. And I think that some people, like a lot of the time, people assume that fatness is a choice. Mm. And it, that isn't always the case. Mm-mm. I feel like TikTok is quite a dangerous. It's very unregulated. There's a more anonymity, I think, on TikTok. A little bit. A little yeah. bit like Twitter. And you know what's so funny about that question is it's a leading question. 
And I feel like you're going to get a certain amount of people who are going to say, no, I wouldn't, who actually would. Mm. And it's that thing of like, it's, you know, we've talked about it in previous episodes about there being this bit of like, you know, some men's men more than women, but that's not to say women aren't the case, like a bit more almost ashamed of yeah they're not going to tell their mates they're going to date someone that's bigger and they're not going to say it in front of their mates straight into the bag of dicks so today we are doing a highly requested episode it's something we've spoken about a bit before in our mental health stories episode and throughout the first two seasons we speak about it quite a lot to be honest but today we're going to do a little bit more of a deep dive into anxiety and thank God we've got an expert in the room because I feel like me and Laura probably both need it. So a huge welcome to anxiety therapist Josh Fletcher, who's known on Instagram as Anxiety Josh, which is the best name ever. So thank you so much for coming to Go Love Yourself. How are you doing? Thanks for having me on. I'm doing well. Thank you. My my first name isn't actually Anxiety. Is it? It's <laughs> not my, my, officially my, on the birth certificate. My mum would be uh, yeah, a bit of a sadist if she was doing that. <laughs> It's just like a foreboding. (laughs) What a self-fulfilling name. Yeah, 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 for sure. Oh, it's so nice to have you on. I'm so excited about this episode, I've got to say. Yeah, Lauren might cry, but we're 100% going to cry. Um, So before we start, we've actually got a new uh, segment of our podcast, which is uh, basically where we put things that we don't like into the bag of dicks. (laughs) <laughs> Which don't don't worry everyone, we've got it here with us today. And I know it's it an actual snack with a white penis on it. <laughs> what have I walked into? <laughs> Welcome. You can you can't leave now. Like you realise that like you're you're here now. <laughs> we've started. So, anything you want to put in the bag of dicks, Josh? Toxic wellness culture. Oh, oh is this God. the kind of thing that's going viral on TikTok at the minute? It's like the five to nine before the nine to five. Is it that kind of like people are sh- people are putting in? They're getting up at five to a bunch of really good stuff, which is all the good, like the walking, the the breakfast, the the running, the exercise thing, the cleaning, all that kind of stuff. And it's like this thing of like you got to have a five to nine before you even have a nine to five. Is yeah, that I that know. kind of thing? Yeah, probably. Okay. Yeah, I'm probably, like, yeah. who's getting up at five? Unless it's so many work. people. But then yeah. my favorite one I saw this morning is someone saying, "This is my five to nine and her like five, six, seven, eight asleep. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. <laughs> it's like five to nine. Oh, okay, laptop in the bed. Like, yeah, that's my kind of five to nine. Can I add to that, to yours? Of, and can I add um, what I eat in a day? Because it's kind of part of that. Can we put that in the bag as well? Oh, yeah. And there's just like some Hate like them. flavorless cracker and like <laughs> a, a neglected aubergine and, yeah. and someone smiling. <laughs> yeah. I yeah. <laughs> no, I didn't mean that. I didn't. No, we're t- I, did, I honestly didn't. But like. <laughs> Nothing worse than the <laughs> Oh, we're talking about something so serious. I'm Lauren so is, sorry. Lauren oh, no. is sexually frustrated. Anyway, <laughs> moving on. <laughs> Good, I'm so glad we can tell her. <laughs> What's that got to do with neglected aubergines? We are, well, I don't, who knows. <laughs> How do we move on How do we from move on? neglected aubergines? Well, mostly, that is a very good thing to put in the bag of dicks. Yes, I agree. I would say. Should we start by asking you, can you tell us a bit about your experience with anxiety and OCD? Yeah. um, So I became a therapist because I used to struggle really badly with an anxiety disorder or several. Mm -hmm. Um, It started one day during a very stressful time in my life where I, in the morning, suddenly at work, I had a huge panic attack. Never had one before. I thought I was dying. In fact, no, I thought I was going crazy, Mm. then dying. Naturally, I thought I was going crazy. Then I was going to have a heart attack. Then I was going to die. Um, and I was just making a cup of tea. And suddenly, I was overwhelmed by all these really intense feelings. I felt dissociated. Um, I didn't feel like me. I could hear my voice. Uh, I have all these loud what-if thoughts. Uh, everyone looked a bit weird. I was like, oh, you've gone and done it, Josh. You've broken your brain. Well done. <laughs> it, was co- it was coming one it's day. It's happened. It's happened. It's done. Um, and that was the start of... Um, something called panic disorder which is a when you have a panic attack and you hate it so much that you fear another one happening mm. oh my god so, that's terrifying yeah and I then i didn't know that was a thing that's terrifying oh it's very 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 yeah. common and then i developed agoraphobia which is the fear of going anywhere just in case you panic i mean there's a misconception that it's like a fear of open spaces but actually no it's a lot more um complex than that i finally kind of worked out what was happening with me after a long time of not getting the correct help, well, at the time I was a teacher, I was like, how can I merge my passion for telling people about anxiety as well as my skill set as a teacher? Mm. So I thought, I'll teach about anxiety. And and thus, Anxiety Josh was born <laughs> <laughs> from, from, the, from the embers. And, uh, 
Um, and yeah, I, since then, yeah, I've, I've, I'm, I'm really love still to this to this day like to uh, teaching people about and educating mm. about anxiety and what they don't tell you and hopefully i can uh, share some of that with you yeah with you guys today that sounds awesome thank you we've had so many questions from our listeners but both like laura and i've struggled with anxiety for different things i think mine was spurred on by a series of lots of stressful things and then one traumatic thing in a short space of time and then it was like oh hi you've got anxiety now and i didn't know what it was i thought i was going crazy like like, like that i had a couple of panic attacks didn't know what to do with it it's one of those things it's kind of a bit of a leftover now I've got it so if something happens or I'm going through stress I experience it so for example at the minute I'm the most anxious of all the anxious ever that I've been probably so and it's just really shit and then you've had it since you were little I think or uh, younger yeah I think well I've, I think I've always been an anxious person but then I think when I was like 23 24 I got into my like first serious relationship and I just had all these feelings and of like I just was really overwhelmed with it. And similar to you, my my first um, anxiety panic attack, I don't know what it really it was, sounded quite sounds quite similar. And it happened in the bathroom at, at work in the toilets. <clears throat> and I like completely disassociated, if that's the right word. Mm. And it was almost like this uh, heat sort of swelled in me. And then things just went blurry. And I was like almost sort of, like shaky, but it wasn't like a panic attack like breathing mm -hmm. didn't really affect my breathing and it the only way I can really describe it is a living nightmare mm -hmm. oh my gosh and then every time I used to go into the bathroom it was then a trigger and then the fear of having it maybe then not all the time but a lot of the time I would have one and then the bathroom became a trigger so then the bathroom for me even at then at home would then become a trigger and that lasted for years until I was officially diagnosed with anxiety at 24 it was put on citalopram I've gone up and up through the years and I have to say for me personally I think it works wonders um, and I haven't had one of those anxiety attacks in probably like three or four years mm -hmm. I think that and a lot of our listeners have kind of said this is that we all have anxiety don't we I think like you know people but I think there is a difference between having anxiety and having an anxiety disorder. Mm -hmm. um, and sometimes I think that, well, one of the questions that we actually had from one of our listeners was, how do I get taken seriously? Because people call me snowflake. Is that something mm -hmm. that you kind of like come across with your patients and in your work? Yeah, of course. I mean, emotional conservatism, you know, is the, when we revere holding back our emotions our ability to keep our emotions quiet is something that you know that's been passed down for generations um no criticism there we you know it was needed many years ago to get through world wars and things but it's a bit redundant in my opinion now yeah well, let's go to the whistle stop tour of yes, please. different anxiety <laughs> presentations <Buckle> <laughs> so obviously conventionally anxious um We'll start with GAD, generalized anxiety. It's mm. the one that doctors usually go, oh, I don't know what's up with you. You've got generalized anxiety. Oh, yeah, I got yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I had that. Nice. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, yeah. Just, they just, they just, everyone, just look at you, right? I've got four minutes left for you. Uh, oh, well, GAD, so, yeah. get out. Uh, have your search lean on your bike. There we go. So we've, got, we've got a therapist for you in two years. So, generalized anxiety is usually when your brain often gives you scenarios and catastrophes and your threat response is constantly on. And when your threat response is constantly on, you see things through the lens of threat. So suddenly, you know, you can see a stranger without the lens of threat. Oh, oh, there's a, there's a stranger. Hi. See a stranger through the lens of threat. They're out to get me. They're judging me. Maybe, you know, you can feel your heart beating just normally. That's fine. Through the lens of threat. Oh God, am I, I going to have a heart attack? You know you've got generalized anxiety when you ruminate and ruminate and ruminate. And that is, means when you just stew in your own thoughts, play out catastrophes in your own head because it feel, you feel it gives the illusion that you have some kind of control over, the th over these things that don't want to happen. Always what ifs, what if this happens, what if that happens, what if that happens. And a sense of unease and doom constantly. That's generalized anxiety. It doesn't really fixate on anything. It can just pick on everything anything and everything right. and it moves quite often um next up you've got panic disorder which is fear of fear that's the one i initially had when i had a panic attack and it felt so scary that i moved my life to try and never have a panic attack again and i did and it was, it was very insidious it was slow 
I started to cut things out of my life. I started to not go to certain places. I decided to self-medicate. I started to do all these things. And I was like, oh, just so I don't have to fear that horrible experience that I mm. had until one starts to outweigh the other. And it's like actually at the cost of not wanting to have a panic attack. Yeah, I've cut out living. load. Not living, yeah. And then I was having panic attacks anyway. <laughs> so, so, <laughs> was the, so, was the, so that's panic disorder. You've got... Um, Obsessive compulsive disorder, which is mostly people who have intrusive thoughts, um, usually mm -hmm. disturbing images. OCD is very common, but it always feeds on the opposite of your morals. Right. So I you didn't know, know that side of it either. That's, it's it's most of it to be honest. Look, when you do get wild. people with symmetry OCD and stuff, but it's it's full of infinite subtypes. I feel like a lot of people say. And I used to, I'm, I'm guilty of this myself, even up to a couple of years ago, I would say like, oh yeah, sorry, I'm a, bit, I'm a bit OCD. And what I meant was, I'm a bit of a clean freak. And for me, I like to have a tidy desk at work. Um, and I actually, I was, um, I met someone a couple of years ago, I was having my makeup done for something. And I said, oh, I, I mentioned something about like OCD. And she said, and I could just see her response. And she, and then I, I got a 20 minute kind of debrief about how it had ruined her life and how it's not about that and how it like mm -hmm. the intrusive thoughts and it's yeah I think it is quite common a lot of people kind of just dismiss I like a little bit like with anxiety I think sometimes yeah it, but it's, yeah it's, I think it it's does, language it's, to different people isn't it? I don't take it personally when no. someone says uh, you know it's, it's a bit annoying but it, you look at people's intentions don't you I think if you yeah, just going to get true. annoyed it's at a people. very nice way to look at it Josh well, yeah, well, that <laughs> is actually yeah well, super nice <laughs> well look, I would go home and tear my hair out if I get you know got annoyed at everyone's you know true. language and stuff like that but yeah no series uh, yeah I mean that's a common one isn't it um I mean, I love to live in my own filth, if that makes sense. Clears that up. And I've had OCD for years. I'd often, you know, you wouldn't walk into you wouldn't walk into, uh, into my house and be like, oh, he's got OCD. You know? But DVDs are not in alphabetical order. Right, the fact you've got yeah. DVDs is very upsetting. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> hey, there's nothing wrong with Homeward Bound one and two. Brilliant. Oh, and um, still got them. Didn't even know there was a two. <laughs> I'm just trying, just trying to make you cry. Subtle, <laughs> subtle stuff in there. Um, yeah, uh, other ones you've got uh, social anxiety. Uh, that can be quite complex. So some people with social anxiety will often, you know, care what people think. They'll try and play out conversations before an event, during the event, and have an analysis afterwards. Uh, so people with social anxiety often find it difficult to say no. They're people pleasers. They never really take time to think about what they think of the other person. They're just a lot of the energy is poured into placating the person in front of them. Mm. Uh, usually, usually because of <laughs> yeah, usually because yeah. of bullying or having a, a a weird upbringing or maybe there's some trauma, social anxiety. There's so many different reasons why people can be socially anxious. I because so for social anxiety for me. Or my knowledge of it is that it's one of those things that you don't go and ask, you don't like going to social. You're an introvert, like you don't like going into social. Okay, so that's what for me I thought social anxiety was. But everything you just said, I'm like, oh, like you, like ding 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 ding. No, like no, the people pleasing you, side. The you can have social anxiety and speak to most people. Mm. I had social anxiety pretty bad until there was a particular kind of person I'd speak to, and it would be a trigger in in me, I'd be like why am I reacting this way to this certain person? Why am I finding it difficult to say no? Why am I people pleasing? It's when, you know, when you usually end up in bad relationships, it's usually this unprocessed stuff. Uh, and I was like, oh yeah, I was drawn to this person even though I knew, just knew rationally it wasn't great and stuff like that. Oh so yeah, gosh. social anxiety. <laughs> social anxiety. What has happened? I yes, love, this is my life now, yeah. <laughs> as a therapist, when people come in like, I have social anxiety, I sit back, oh, this is going to be juicy. <laughs> Oh, finally, no, yes, no, sick of all the, the panic tea. attack people. <laughs> panic attack people, go away. Let's mix it up a bit. Panic attack, <laughs> panic attack. <laughs> Such a nice people. Yeah, and then and then you've got and then I mean, there's plenty plenty of other presentations. You've got things like um, PTSD, complex trauma. Mm. Anyone who's been through something traumatic, and you know, you've got PTSD when you have like flashbacks or certain smells send you into right. overdrive, and and it puts you in this threat response so there's a little kind of cashew shaped part of our brain called the amygdala uh, a good word, isn't it? yeah oh, it's like it, a greek god or something yeah i, I don't on. know if, it, uh, if it's or latin or, 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 I, I, I just should, I should, I should know i don't um, <laughs> <God> Josh. <laughs> um uh, and the amygdala is the fastest but 
dumbest part of our brains. Uh, it will act faster than your thinking brain. Uh, I'll give you some examples of the, what the amygdala can do. So have you ever had one of those dreams where you're nodding off and suddenly like you dream you fall over a curb or something and you yes. drop back up? Yeah. That's the amygdala oh. hijacking your brain and body and putting you just in case you're in danger. Oh, wow. That's all anxiety is. It's it's a threat response. Right. Some people have it first thing in the morning, like, Ooh, I've got a threat response. I can't, not quite sure what it is. Why is my threat response going oh, on? Oh, good, because I guess I, I, I literally will be like, I'm anxious. Why am I anxious? What am I anxious about? And then I'll have to like list all the things. So it's that like <laughs> threat response of like, what am I? I literally will be walking like, what, what's happening? It was like an immediate, like, oh, mm -hmm. what's what's happened? And then you kind of go through your head. Oh, good. I'm glad that sometimes it happens when you don't know what it oh, is. Oh, absolutely. Well, that's what most of the disordered anxiety is about. And that's where it started for me. Because when you start to get anxious for no reason or no identifiable reason, um, that's when it can become quite unnerving. And, you know, when you tell people who only understand conventional anxiety, they'll be like, what have you got to worry about? I'm like, I don't know. I'm worrying about why I'm not worrying. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't know what I'm not to worry about. Yeah. 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 I get to my day off. I've had a really stressful week and suddenly I wake up and I'm like, I'm really anxious. And is that why like sometimes, you know, like they say like the straw that broke the camel's back, but like why small things? Because I sometimes feel like that, like something small will, will really like really upset me for days or hours. And then like, I think to other people, they'd be thinking, oh, just like get over it. Yeah. But it's not that easy, I don't think, when you have anxiety, you have to live with that because small things, like, they fester. Mm. Do you get that? Yeah, uh, that makes so much sense. And it's usually, I mean, when it started for me, it was when I dropped a spoon and it was too loud. And that was the final drop in the top of the flask and it overflowed. Or right. I think one of my clients said once, it was like, buckaroo. Remember that oh, really yeah. traumatizing game? <laughs> yeah, I do like, remember. Like, That's a vital right. flight is, right this, there. This is not fun. Like just anticipation is like too much. <laughs> and they're like, like just, just kick already. <laughs> I got my first You're a Fat Bitch the other day. What? Woohoo. Uh, I had someone, um, I was in m and car park. Thank you. And these horrible, they must have been like late teenagers, were yelling the most disgusting racist comment at this woman i'd ever heard in my entire life like I, would, I, I nearly cried it was disgusting and i was like and i just i had my nan with me god and i just like went for this girl and i was like whatever i said and then she was like well fucking look at you then i was like oh, i'm just here like <laughs> leave me alone That's so yeah for i know but like you kind of rationalize it with like you're, you're clearly a dickhead like, yeah i'm not really yeah. gonna worry about what you think yeah but i know that you have had that before loads of our listeners have had it where they've had all these awful comments and stuff and there's such mm. a direct correlation do you get that a lot with patients or just people that you speak to as well yeah yeah it's it it's a it's a difficult one as well with particularly with, with body image or anything any focus on the self because our brains are actually kind of designed to always on some level care what people think mm. because for our ancestors like thousands of years ago you know if you had to kind of people please and care what the tribe thought otherwise you'd get banished you know, and then you, you know, I, I can't survive without, you know, <laughs> without, without a takeaway number, never mind going walking around the wilderness. But then when you look at kind of what we're going to look at collectively is within the tribe society now is what what are the conditions of worth that are we um, going to pin importance to? And unfortunately, image is, is still very strong. Yeah. For me, growing up, definitely, I, I definitely felt like an outsider because of my size and it really affected like my and it's funny because I think when I was younger I didn't realize I had anxiety but now actually really just from what you just said I'm like oh yeah I did <laughs> I don't know what it's like not to be anxious <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, I think like it stopped me doing so much you talking it just kind of trigger things all of my friends used to hang out at McDonald's after school and I never did I never went to McDonald's because I didn't want to be the fat girl at McDonald's because I was so anxious that people would be make fun of me whilst I was in there. It def definitely defined me. And I think I've said this before, but I, I, I think growing up, I wasn't, I felt like I was my body, like my body defined me. Mm. Um, and I, like, it sucks. Like, I just hate that I, like 15 year old Laura had to, to do that. I mean, anxiety and avoidance go hand in hand. Um, my strong philosophy, um, particularly work with panic attacks, is that people measure their wellness 
their health on the amount of panic attacks they've had. Oh, I haven't had a panic attack three years. I had one three days ago. I just don't mind. Mm. Because oh, what I'm teaching the brain is that I'm not avoiding it. Right. And now I don't avoid places because actually what you're fearing is not the places. Unless it's a particular traumatic trigger that's different. Or there's actual danger. You know, we call it a threat response. Not to forget there's actual threats out there. Mm. Every time you avoid something because you're afraid of what will happen, even though rationally you know it's safe, what you do there is you thank the threat response. Now, I couldn't leave my house for a year because my threat response was saying, if you go outside, something bad will happen, agoraphobia. So every time I said, all right, yeah, I'll avoid, I'll do it tomorrow. I'm just thanking my, my threat response. It doesn't turn off. You can't think it away, but it does turn off with your behavior. And when I found that out, oh, it was really empowering. Yeah. And I pushed it and pushed it and pushed it and pushed it and pushed it. Everything the threat response was telling me not to do you know, I, I lent into the 51% of, well, 51% of me wants to do it, so I'm going to do that instead. And you start to re literally rewire your brain. Mm -hmm. That's how people can change. The brain can change itself. Anything you fear, whether it's judgment, maybe you're afraid of panic attacks, maybe you're obsessed with your own anxiety, maybe there's a new job you want to go for, maybe there's just a lifestyle change, and you've been avoiding and putting it off. If you step into it, the brain rewires itself over time and and just habituates to it it gets mm -hmm. used to it and that's what i try to encourage people so when people come into my practice say oh josh i've had five panic attacks this week i was like brilliant how did how did you get on with them which one did you tolerate the best oh the last one so if you notice that you're tolerating them better oh yeah so what happens when you have a belief that you can tolerate anxiety then i'm not going to avoid i mean i don't like the word journey but that is a quite an incredible journey to go from not leaving your house for a year to now <laughs> How much do you want to sing right Johnny. now? <laughs> <laughs> did you get help yourself? Like, how did you get to where you are now? Um, I This was about 10 years ago. Um, I did get help and I was put on, immediately put on kind of antidepressants, which made me worse. Um, I'm not saying antidepressants make you worse. That each medication is different for, for each person. Yeah, I was going to ask you about that, actually. We'll come on to that. Yeah, I mean, for me, I wasn't quite depressed at the time. Um, I was just really, really anxious and afraid mm. of why I felt so weird. I felt different. I felt I, I don't feel like me. I feel like I've broken my brain. What's going on? And so there's this constant hypervigilant scanning of the self. So when I was taking antidepressants, I was like, is this going to make me worse or is it going to make me better? And then it's just encouraging that scanning of the self, which for me, which was a very OCD trait as well, where I was fixating, um, I was like, okay, right, well, this is just creating more anxiety. What I did was actually discovered the works of um, Dr. Claire Weeks in the 1960s and 70s, one of my heroes. Basically, it was, it was literature around lived experience and people who understood what this particular anxiety was because I felt really lost, isolated, incredibly depressed. And then I discovered that work. I was like, oh, there's other people out there. Oh, I'm not going crazy. I mean, okay. Well, we'll go with that and i started to learn more and i started to become empowered and then i started i self-published like a book when i was 23 it's written awfully i cringe every time i look at it <laughs> i was like oh my gosh and i just threw that in the sphere and pe people started like picking up and going oh my god that's me that's me that's me and suddenly i was like oh people need who well who struggle with this type of anxiety need the education about it mm. you know i'm sick of people telling me to deep breathe and do all these things i'm like i've been doing that all week yeah. Yeah, like, like, nothing's happening i've, I've cut out gluten i've done all these things yeah. what why have i done that it's nothing to do with with my anxiety my husband says to me <laughs> when i say i'm anxious he goes oh just don't just, just stop worry about it that was the Helpful. answer the whole time just <laughs> don't but actually but you can't talk to your amygdala your threat response so it doesn't matter what you say to yourself it's not listening because there's no wiring connection things like that i was learning so when i'm stood there going calm down there's nothing to worry about actually scientifically it's pointless me doing that really because there's no wiring from your talking brain your prefrontal cortex to your amygdala your threat response what's making you anxious so when people have these mantras and they do all these things it's pointless 
I might as well just do the jig and say the world's burning. It doesn't matter. It's not listening. Oh, wow. Uh, yeah. Okay. And so what do you do You've instead? You've upset a lot of people it right will, now, I it will, it will, <laughs> No, self-talk's okay. Mm. And I've got, but when you're doing it to turn off anxiety, oh, okay. um, actually, there's no wire in there. Um, mm. but you can be kind to yourself. So what you can do is you self-talk and go, okay, my threat response has decided to kick off. Adrenaline and cortisol is in my veins. Now, what's great is that adrenaline can't really last very long in my veins and my body can't keep producing. It's impossible. So whilst this feels really uncomfortable now and I feel awful, what I can know is that I can tolerate this. Mm. I'm brave. I'm being courageous. I don't need to avoid. And I know factually that this will pass. All feelings are transient. So... Unfortunately, that includes happiness and joy. Oh, uh, but damn it, Josh. you know, I'll tell you, <laughs> <laughs> I don't get invited to parties very often. <laughs> no. All feelings are transient. <laughs> joy <laughs> might last. <laughs> joy. <laughs> joy is a construct. Goodbye, like. <laughs> You're banned, mate. Get out of here. Yeah. <laughs> I'm that person as well. When I was going through stuff, I needed to find, I needed the scientific stuff. I needed to do the research. I needed to understand. Because the science doesn't sound that scary. No. And I'm, I was just the same as you. Once mm. I found, once I knew what was happening to me and in my body, it's less scary. Mm. Um, a game I like to play with my clients, if you want to join, is uh, Anxiety Bingo. <laughs> And, and then let's do and, it. Let's do it. Oh, uh, you really uh, are hoot and a half at the parties. Yeah, yeah okay. Yeah. I, really, uh, <laughs> I really don't get that advice, guys. Uh, and um, so I th- just to, if you're anxious, it's good to just remember what it is because anxiety presents itself in so many different ways. Do you remember Woolworths Pick and Mix? Absolutely. Oh, oh the best. Oh, yeah, yeah. Imagine your yeah. anxiety as a bag of Woolworths Pick and Mix. Oh, don't ruin Woolworths Pick and Mix. Oh, it's one of the good childhood memories. <laughs> Damn it. <laughs> I'll have Go 20 on. grams of childhood trauma <laughs> <laughs> and some strobulators. <laughs> yeah, and uh, and uh, so the anxiety is split into three, but I like to do it anyway. Um, and it's like you've got your thoughts, feelings, and sensations. So we'll start with thoughts. So, you know, how many of you like listening, how many times have you had, you know, a, a what if thought? What if this catastrophe happens? But anxiety can also be an I can't thought. So if you have a thought like, oh, I can't do that, that avoidance, that's, that's part one. And, and then also, I should, which I mentioned briefly before about, you know, I should be doing this, mm. should be doing that, I should be doing this, I should be putting everything else before me first, before I am the, the last, I am the least priority, which is sad, it makes me sad when I hear that. So that's like the thoughts. Then the second part of anxiety, you've got... Um, your feelings. So anxiety isn't just, I feel anxious. They are feelings of dread. They're feelings of doom, I hear quite a lot. You get feelings of, yeah, nervousness. Uh, anticipate, and you know, negative anticipation. Positive anticipation. If you can get good anxiety, you know, I'm really excited to go mm-hmm. on that roller coaster or that first date or whatever. Um, that's good anxiety. Oh, oh you can have oh, good yeah, anxiety. Yeah, love the first day anxiety. It's great. Really? That's good anxiety, I would say. Really? Yeah, yeah. I'm with though. <laughs> <laughs> I don't miss those days. It's an extra excitement. <laughs> um, and then in the last section of the pick and mix, you've got um, sensations. So, and there's such like a huge list of these. So, dissociation, so derealization. Uh, where we don't feel like we're here, like we're in the matrix or we're not in our body. Mm. Only temporary. Or this too will pass. Mm. Chest pains, sweating, um, muscle tension is a big one. Jelly legs, dizziness, lightheadedness. Oh, we're going through them all now. Sounds Dig- fun. Dig- Sounds Dig- great. Digestion problems. Um, this is great. Yeah, loads of them. There's absolutely, I mean, just loads of them. A lot of people get tingly hands and feet, don't they? Tingly hands and feet, uh, menstrual cycles out the window. You've got, uh, yeah, you can't eat dry eyes. Eye floaters is one I get, like these little things just floating in your eye because you're stressed. Uh, tinnitus. And I was having all these and no one was telling me what was going on. What? And then so I kind of just wrote them all out one day. I was like, right, if I have another symptom that isn't on this chart, which I never have done, by the way, I'm like, <laughs> I was like, this chart was, was pretty intense. I was like, okay, right. I think I've got anxiety nailed down now. Mm. And so I invite my clients and stuff to be like, okay, well, I think I'm anxious, but it, it could be anxiety and something else. I was like, well, let's write it down. What are your thoughts? Oh, well, I'm having a what if I've got a brain tumor. 
Okay, how does it make you feel? Uh, doom, kind of a bit scared. Okay, and what sensations are you having? Okay, dizziness, headaches, and I can't catch my breath, and my heart's going. I was like, well, sounds a bit like anxiety. Mm. I mean, if you really worry, go to your doctor. And they're like, actually, yeah, I think it's just anxiety because I feel the same like I yeah. usually do. Mm. But anyway, that's uh, that's the uh, the pick and mix. I mean, it's not one that you'd run <laughs> burst not into Woolworths really for. Want, yeah, in, 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 in a, in a set, yeah but, I'm yeah, not it, remortgaging it, my house to get that pick <laughs> and mix at the, uh, at the cinema. Yeah, no. It's so expensive, <laughs> isn't it? Oh, oh God, God, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm so glad you, you said that, though, because I think... I think sometimes there's a misconception that if you're anxious, like it's just nerves and like that bit of like feeling in your tummy or it's the full blown like panic attack where you can't breathe. And when I've tried to explain to people these kind of weird things that I was having, this nightmare quality, like uh, it definitely was heart palpitations, just the strangest sensation, I have to say. Like I don't want another one, like ever. Honestly, like literally up until two minutes ago, I thought it was an absolute freak, and I was the only person that would have experienced something like that because it wasn't the <gasps> can't breathe, need a paper bag. No, most Common. anxiety attacks yeah. aren't what you see on Netflix. You're not like on all fours, can't breathe. You know, yeah. flashbacks. Dad didn't come to my baseball game. Whatever. <laughs> and it's not. That's not what an anxiety attack. You can't notice most anxiety attacks. I have sat around a table like this and had a full blown dissociative anxiety attack where everyone looks like clay. Mm. No one noticed. Five minutes later, I felt fine. I was mm. like, oh, well that adrenaline and cortisol's passed because I didn't avoid and I stayed there and it's okay. I'm, I reassured myself, went into my pick and mix. I was like, ah yes, an anxiety. And also what's great is that at the end of an anxiety attack, and I always say to people, you feel great, you feel tired, but it feels really good. You're like, oh. Really? Oh, always. If you don't avoid. Oh, okay. It's it's, it's worth sticking it out. It really is. I always is. felt, I remember feeling very shaken and physic, like physically I felt different. Like physically mm. felt heavy. My heart would feel, and then I would, like I can't, yeah, it's really hard to put it into words because like I said, I haven't had one in a while. Mm. But it was, even afterwards, I felt very, almost like bruised, like is in mentally and like physically oh sense. yes well they're exhausting because yeah you, you know you're having like a week's worth of, adre of adrenaline yeah. at once but you don't but have to feel like that you will feel like that because that's the adrenaline has to have an outlet okay so all your muscles will tense up mm. you will feel heavy you'll be like Oof, your heart will be going like that it's awful it feels awful but if you stick it out and let all the adrenaline pass and cause and it takes like it took me a long time to you know, you practice it. It's not just a, I'll stick it out. You know, it's it's a lot harder to, mm. to do than it is to say. But if you do it at the end of it, you, it actually feels really good. Get your control Sounds, back. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, That's really powerful. Yeah, and I remember my first one, and I've done lots of conventionally scary things. I always have done, but my bravest I've ever been was I went into Asda. Which it's one might I, what, It's going off. It's, <laughs> yeah. let, let me You've set. been to Gravesend, Asta, then. <laughs> You'll know how scary it is. <laughs> let me set the scene. <laughs> was a, was the whoopsie aisle was there. And, uh, whoopsie yeah, aisle. Yeah, there was some yeah. like 10 P eclairs I wanted, but my crippling agoraphobia didn't um, allow me. Uh, it was the scariest exposure I've ever done, exposing myself to like, these triggers. And, and I, I was like 9, 10 out of 10 scared uh, to the point where I thought I was going to go crazy. I was going to be taken away in the van to somewhere to the lab uh and everything was I, I had that heaviness i just felt like i was dizzy i was gonna faint collapse pass out um that was the most scared i've ever been in my life do it it's worth the feeling at the end as long as you're kind to yourself mm -hmm. yeah i like that we had loads of listener questions like this was one of my most popular oh fire them away topic. yeah, yeah. No, you're basically here to solve everyone's problems so the first question we had in from one of our listeners uh is uh, how do I know when it's enough of an issue to see the GP or start medication? Okay, so you know anxiety has become too much when the majority of your day is dictated by a sense of fear. If you have decided that anxiety, that disordered side of anxiety um, needs addressing and there's a problem, uh, then your first port of call is to go to your GP. Now, you probably get offered um, some antidepressants like sertraline, citalopram, um, and it's up to you 
if you want to take them or not. And they might offer you um, some sessions of cognitive behavioral therapy, um, usually long waiting lists. And I love CBT. I'm trained in it as well as other modalities. And when you get a therapist who understands anxiety really well, it can be life changing. It certainly helped me. I think it is so important, isn't it, to find someone that you connect with. I've had, I reckon, probably about eight or nine different counsellors and I've only really connected and I, re- and I mean, like, actually got something out of, t- like, two of them. Mm. And that's not to say that the others were shit. Some of them were. <laughs> <laughs> Maggie, no, I don't know. I'm looking at you, Maggie. No, I'm joking. There's a lot Poor bad, Maggie. There's a lot of bad therapists out there as well. I'm not going to... Yeah, there are, with. there are. But I think it's, the thing is, is that the ones I thought were shit or whatever, they're not shit. They're just not for me. Yeah. Didn't understand me. No it, connection. Yeah. That's the thing you just got to look for. Like I remember, like I went through my GP um, when I was 24, and I got ther- uh, therapy through Mind, and it was free. A lady called Tina, and, and she changed my life. Mm. And she was a big lady, so I think she got it as well from that aspect. But also, I didn't want to go to someone that was like, "And how does that make you feel?" Where it, so <laughs> she which is was... the title to my new book. <laughs> Is it, I'm not even it, joking. Is it really? <laughs> yeah. Oh no, I'm so sorry. No, it, that's the joke. Is it ironic? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's I was like, God. Can you, can you oh, picture so me? You know me for an hour. God. Can you picture me saying that? <laughs> no, to be fair, I can't. Yeah. yeah. Oh, phew. Yeah. Um, yeah, I didn't want that. And she she was the antithesis of that. And she would be like, for fuck's sake, Laura, <laughs> why have you thought that for? But I needed that. That's good. I needed that. But, not, but that I wouldn't needed. work for everybody. No, not like, at Some all. people would be like, this is my worst nightmare. Yeah, so that's all I kind of just wanted. My two cents of that is like, if you go to a counsellor and you're like, oh God, this is not for me. It might not be that it's not for you. It might be that you just haven't found the right person. And there's no shame in that. Go try one session with somebody, try another one with someone else. Yeah, like, mix it up for yeah. sure. Mix it up. Find the one that's sure. right for you. We've turned a very wholesome chat. It's gone very <laughs> sour very quickly here. We've just had a 10, 15 minute offline chat about we're trying to understand what CBT stands for and it, what it means. And apparently it can also stand for cock and ball torture. <laughs> so we have been trying to record for the last 15 minutes. <laughs> But we are not adults. We're trying to have the, we're trying, we've been trying to go back and be like, so Josh, can you tell us, well, what, what does CBT stand for? And then he laughs and then we laugh um, and we're almost ready to Google it. Okay, so, we're going to try our best paper faces. <clears throat> what is CBT? And I'm not going to look at you while I ask you. Right. Just tell us. Just, just talk to the microphone. CBT in this <laughs> psychology world in the sun, yeah. uh, stands for cognitive behavioral therapy. It's really good where it focuses on thoughts and behaviours. It uses kind of um, psychology and the principles of, of psychology and how your brain works to rewire your brain. So your threat response that we were talking about today doesn't go off. Um, or if you struggle with depression, you know, so you don't you get out of the depressive cycle. Um, it can it it can be tricky, and it requires you to do a lot of the work. I think a lot of um, misconception of therapies that you go to sit in the therapy room. And you know you lie on a sofa, and some dude with elbow patches is smoking his pipe. And then once you've, <laughs> you know, once you've told him that you ate mum and dad, that <laughs> all your problems go away. Yeah. Um, don't get me wrong; that that kind of talking therapy like that is really helpful. It's helped me, particularly process grief and trauma and things like that. But in general, if it's something immediate, like it, the CBT is great if you want like immediate changes in your life. Um, right, so back to uh, listener questions. We had a really uh, lovely question on how best to support anxious friends. The best way to support an anxious friend um, is to acknowledge, first of all, you know how brave and courageous they are. And I don't mean that to be cliche and, and awful, but like, you can remember anxiety is literally fear. Your amygdala is kicking off and is triggering that threat response. That is literally fear. Um, and if that friend has decided to push through that fear get out of bed, go to that social event, be with you despite that threat response going off, there's loud what ifs, the scary sensations. I mean, just acknowledge how, I mean, it's literally bravery, isn't it? Like if mm. fear is telling you to avoid and not do something and find the comfort, that was the first sign of comfort, but they're doing things anyway. Uh, I'd acknowledge that. I'd acknowledge that more than once, be like, you know, thanks for coming here. I know you get anxious, but it makes it even more special that you've done that. Yeah. It's even more of a compliment to do that. Yeah. Don't pity them. Just be like, yeah, look how, you know, you're nailing this. Things mm. will change. Uh, and when when we're anxious, you know, and I'll be the first to say, you know, we, we, we're not, 
we don't, we're not our ideal selves who we'd like to be, but stick around for that ideal version of themselves, for mm -hmm. what they deem as ideal, because not only is their company worthy of it now, you know, it will be even more worthwhile when they feel more comfortable in themselves. And if you stuck around for that, then it's it's, it's a joy for you both, isn't it? Yeah, oh, that's so nice. I love the way you so framed nice. it of bravery. That's really nice. I love mm. that. So a lot of um, our listeners also wrote in to uh, ask for some advice about dealing with the kind of side effects that come with having anxiety. Um, one of those was sleep. I don't know if you've got any advice for how anxiety can affect sleep and any ways to kind of overcome that and get I, a good night's I, rest. I love answering this. <laughs> uh, I was in, I was invited to the the Neom Restival. Uh, as a, as a, rest of all as an, oh, brilliant. As, an, oh, as, an <laughs> as an anxiety expert and, <laughs> and it just got to and I'm like, what what's your best tips for getting good night's sleep and, and my answer was stop trying a lot of anxious people are afraid of not getting enough sleep mm. and when you take that fear to bed you're taking that cortisol and adrenaline to bed and you ain't gonna go to sleep with cortisol and adrenaline in your system when i work with insom insomnia um clients is that their first homework is to stay up all night I'm like, what okay <laughs> i came to you to help me with sleep <laughs> and now you're telling me to not do that That's and i was like so because i'm exposing you to the fear yeah. and the belief that you think you won't be able to cope the next day have you guys done this where you're looking at the clock like oh, if i go to sleep now i'll get five hours yes if i go to sleep now i'll get four all hours time. yeah if you're that person i encourage you if you can plan it stay up all night and see what happens <laughs> You'll be groggy <laughs> and horrible. You'll still function. Yeah. And suddenly you've removed the illusion that you not getting any sleep means you won't function. And that's the first thing I do with my clients. I said, stop trying to sleep. If I'm not tired, I will not go to bed. Uh, so mm. sometimes I go to bed at 2 a.m. Sometimes I go to bed at 10 p.m. I go to bed when my body says to go to bed. There's all this emphasis on routine and this, that, and circadian rhythms, whatever. I mean, whatever works for you. But if you, if you struggle with insomnia, oh. You're one of the, and I know what it's like. I guess every year, you know, they always get them. They're like, I've done the sleep routines. I've got the pillow mists. I'm doing all this and doing all that. Uh, and, 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 and I must have the pillow mist. Yeah, yeah. Oh, it is great. That stuff. It is anyway, good, yeah. And, uh, <laughs> and um, you ain't getting any sleep. You're not. Yeah, yeah. No. Where, whereas once you just let, like, let go of the fear of not getting sleep and realize that you'll function regardless, you'll actually sleep better. I'd rather have three hours of non resistant sleep than eight hours of tossing and turning mm. because I'm trying to simulate what is supposed to be good sleep. Uh, okay, and what about catastrophizing? So when you're catastrophizing, you, well, you know you're catastrophizing when you've got loads of what ifs and a sense of something bad's gonna happen. Yeah. So what you can do is imagine the scenario that you're catastrophizing about uh, on a spectrum. You've got one end, really not likely. On the other hand, it's probably happening right now. The threat response will, will, its job is to make you think that it's the extreme end of the spectrum, like it's going, it's happening right now. I mean, how many times have you had a what if thought and been pretty much convinced that mm. that was going to happen? Yeah, worst case scenario, that's what I always think. Yeah. But, but it's not um, just you thinking it, it's the threat response. Right, this is what okay. I say to people. Do you know when people say, you're overthinking, you're I'm like, well, actually, mm. no, my thinking brain and my threat response are working together and they're presenting me with this worst case scenario that feels real mm. it's not just me overthinking it's like you've got to understand these people that just completely dismiss you for it. it's like no actually i'm i'm dealing with something here uh step away from it acknowledge that you know okay my brain's doing this and it's giving me this thought and it feels real but you don't need to engage with it now what it's looking for is what are you going to do next now, are you going to sit there and ruminate and play and play through all the scenarios in your head and all the ways that you can deal with a catastrophe? Well, you've just thanked the threat response then. Are you going to, and this is what I do, my golden rules in my practice are, rule number one, what would non-anxious me be doing right now? Actually, I, I'm about 10 minutes behind what I was going to do because I've been giving this thought loads of attention and worrying about it and Googling it. Okay, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to do that. So what's my behavior doing? And just acknowledge, of course, it's going to throw the worst case scenario at me. My threat response is off. How do I know my threat response is going off? Because of that pick and mix back from before. Bloody know? Woolworths. Yeah, bloody Woolworths, yeah. <laughs> so, so, so if you struggle with anxiety, it's because you visited Woolworths. <laughs> 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 yeah. uh, 
yeah, so like, acknowledging actually detach yourself from it. Like, okay, my brain's doing that. It doesn't mean it's going to happen. Okay. Yeah. I really like what you said just a second ago, but like, what would non anxious me be doing? Can I use that in life of all the things? <laughs> Not just like, because cata- I don't do. think I do the catastrophizing thing, right. which I'm assuming is just like playing out the worst case scenario in your head all the time. Yeah. Like day. when I get into a lift, I imagine it filling up with water and then like, like things like that. Oh my gosh, that's terrifying. Yeah. Okay. That's an intrusive feel that a lot of people have. Yeah. 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 Really? I used to have it in car. Yeah. Big, a big common ones when people driving over bridges Constantly and they drive. think they're going to drive off the bridge. And oh, I've got a plan for that. I yeah. thought that was normal. <laughs> I've got the plan. If it go, if I, if I go off the bridge. Go on then, tell us. Or you have to wind down the window. Obviously. So get out. <laughs> I was a whole. You know, I thought, okay, that's fine. Okay, I had that then. That's cool. Okay. Oh, I didn't know that. That's what that was. Yeah. Yeah. I get quite anxious when it comes to work stuff. Uh, there being reasons for that, but then like when I'm working, I'm, I'm then distracting my brain, so I'm maybe then I don't work as hard, or I'm not working because I'm too freaking anxious to do the thing that I've got to do can I just be like what would non-anxious me be doing we'd be working hard right now and just smashing it would that help me in those situations yeah I always ask I think okay, that's cool. my I mean one of the golden rules I would say is what what two golden rules rule number one is what would non-anxious me be doing and commit myself to that rule number two and it's a bit of a wordy one but it's is what I'm doing right now teaching this threat response this amygdala that this uncertainty is okay even the bridge scenario, you fail rule two. Because if, you so, if you're if you winding down your window driving over a bridge, you're thanking that catastrophe. You're going, okay, just in case that happens, I'm going to do that. The odds of you going off that bridge are infinitesimally small. Mm. So why are you behaving like it's actually one of those things? And the brain will remember. So the next time you go over the bridge, it'll be, you haven't wound down your window. Or maybe you go over a bridge in the back of a cab and I can't wind down my window and suddenly you'll get anxious. Because the brain remembers. It will remember these times that you acted out of defense. And so this, the second wordy one, I maybe need to make it a bit more concise, but they're the ones, yeah, what would what would non-anxious, if in doubt, what would non-anxious me be mm. doing right now? If you feel a panic attack is coming or you think it, it might happen soon, what can you do to prevent it? Is there anything you can do to stop it? What should we do? I must have had probably in the thousands panic attacks Really? Yeah. Well, I, I, I had panic disorder, so I'd have about five a day. Oh, and cool. I mean, really, like, I've ended up in A&E and ambulances because like, I was so scared. So I know what it's like to have a panic attack. And I'm going to audaciously state right now that panic attacks don't exist. Now, before you reach through the dun, speaker dun, and punch dun. Before you reach through the, the speaker and punch me, like, <laughs> how dare you? The worst thing I've ever experienced. Um Tip number one is reframe it. It's nothing's. I don't know who named it a panic attack. Nothing's attacking you. It's an adrenaline flood, an adrenaline rush when you don't want it. Right. It's like, woof, you know that's why lots of people, men, menopausal women get panic attacks because, or adrenaline flushes because, with the hormonal changes, woof, you know you just it strikes you off guard. And so a lot of anxiety disorders start as well in um, in, in, in older women suddenly from nowhere That's so interesting. Uh, yeah. and so it's oh, not God. it's not um it's not a panic attack no one has ever died from a panic attack so i don't understand and, and even just the word attack mm. if your amygdala has decided to release adrenaline and cortisol you're not gonna you can't stop that so it's you just let it go around you but it's just imagine it just going around around your body and out and once it's done a lap of your body and your muscles are tensed up and your heart beats pumped it out it goes and it will then start to try and make more, but it takes time. So you know that it will always pass. This is why I don't do techniques and stuff for panic. And I'm very quite controversial with that. If you have a technique for some, for your panic attacks or your adrenaline f- rushes and floods, and it works for you, that's brilliant. And don't stop it if, if you find it mm-hmm. helpful. For me, I didn't find it helpful because, and again, going back to the golden rules, is what I'm doing right now teaching the body that this panic attack is okay? No, because I've got up, I've left the restaurant, I'm deep box breathing in a cubicle, mm. I'm doing all these things. Well, then what's going to happen the next time I have an adrenaline rush in a restaurant? And then suddenly I'm going to start doing all these behaviors like sitting on the end or finding out where the fire exit is or never going in the fast lane on the motorway or yeah. or never going in a lift or all these different mm. things because I'm starting these avoidance behaviors. Anxious recovery is not measured by the absence 
of negative feelings, mm. it's measured on your ability to willfully to tolerate it. Yeah, yeah. And that's that how you know you're doing so well. powerful. What? Wow. That was awesome. <laughs> yeah. And that, uh, genuinely, and that's the way, and that's the way, that was the way out for me. Mm. And that's why I teach people, you know, I used to think, oh, I'm having panic. That's failure. No, it's not. <laughs> that was an opportunity for me to practice a skill. Honestly, that my mind is blown. That has been an incredible discussion and I'm so grateful. Thank you so much. I'm so glad we did that episode. I loved it. I loved it. I, I loved learned, him. I learned a lot. Yeah, same. Really did. And like even just, just like reframe some of the stuff that, you know, we've been through and how I might deal with stuff in the future, like that. What would my non-anxious mm. self be doing right now? Or think about that. And like, that's kind of a bit of a game changer. I loved him. He was so good. Yeah, he was And great. also behind the scenes, guys, we were absolutely rolling up <laughs> uh, some were. stuff. Like, honestly, I think that's probably the most I've laughed <laughs> in the recording ever. Uh, so I absolutely loved it. I, we obviously really hope you found that um, helpful as well. Um, and just continuing on, like the laughs and the smiley bits, I want to share a post with you that I saw on the Go Love Yourself okay. community group, which made me so smiley and so happy happy so it's from becca and she posted a photo as well and it was just uh, it's just so go love yourself do you know what i mean this is so cute so i'm gonna read it out to you she says hey go love yourself girls i'm in a panto this week in my local lgbtq bar it's good old-fashioned drag panto fun which is maybe the best sentence i've ever heard in <laughs> my entire say, life love everything about yeah that. everything yeah literally good old-fashioned drag panto fun I, yes to all of it um she's playing jasmine in aladdin and as a bigger girl i feel amazing i feel like a disney princess i guess the point of this post is just go for it don't let that little voice tell you not to go for it i love theater but always thought i was only ever good enough to play the fat comedy characters mm. but this feels amazing to play a princess too we've all felt the pressure to be society's media standard of beauty but beauty truly does come from the confidence to be unapologetically you I hope this makes someone feel a bit better about themselves today if they're feeling down. And there was loads of comments underneath it of the same thing. We also had somebody else in the comments say that they played a plus size very godmother. Like, yeah, I just, isn't that just so nice? It's awesome. I love the community we've got on Facebook. If you're not already joined up, then you absolutely have to go to Facebook and search for Go Love Yourself Community. It's a really wonderful, supportive, safe space. It's a closed group as well. You can also DM us on Instagram if you want to chat at Go Love Yourself Pod or you can email go love at crowdnetwork.co.uk. And if you want to support the show, you can do that by subscribing on Patreon or Apple Podcasts, where you can get ad-free or early episodes for £1 a week, or you can listen ad-free on Amazon Music. Or you can watch us on our brand new YouTube channel. Just search for Go Love Yourself. <laughs> we love the YouTube channel. We're literally sitting here waving at the camera. And we've still got a few tickets left to our live show on Friday the 3rd of March. The link to those will be in the episode description. Thank you so much for listening. We really hope you loved this episode as much as we did, and we will see you next week. Bye-bye! Bye-bye! <laughs> so long! <laughs> So long, farewell, I'll be the same